I'm Joel. I'm going to be teaching you guys the chassis dynamometer operation training for Dynocom. But what is a dyno? Everybody knows what a dyno is used for, what it does. It measures horsepower and torque. What else does a dyno measure? Speed, acceleration, acceleration. Measure acceleration and speed. Drivetrain loss, it's on the, it's on the slide. It's, it's giving you all the answers right now. Um, because you, where, where do you measure power at? On a chassis dynamometer, you measure it at the wheels. Um, you can visually see gains and losses. That's part of the tuning process when you're, when you're adjusting your timing, adjusting your AFRs, raising boost levels. Um, provides a safe environment for vehicle operation. In light of what happened, was it yesterday that that happened? You might know the guy that got sucked under the dyno. You know, it provides a safe environment. It's a lot safer than road tuning. Ask me how I know. Me and, me and ditches, we get along great. Um, Provides a stable test environment with minimum variables. That is partially up to you guys. Um, the kind of airflow you have in your shop, the kind of, you know, getting the exhaust gases out, stuff like that. Uh, I'm trying to think, the, the old Braves owner, the guy that used to own the Atlanta Braves, Bobby something, he might have been a coach. He had the saying, everything changes everything. So when you make a change to the environment, you're, you're gonna make a change to the, to the output of the vehicle. So you have to be very careful the, the dyno minimizes as many variables as it can. It's up to you to minimize the rest, have like a stable airflow. Don't decide to add a whole bunch of fans because you're going to end up doing some ram tuning that you didn't mean to do, stuff like that. Uh, diagnostics and data logging. You can actually use a dyno to hunt down drivetrain problems. Uh, if any of you guys are jobbers, you do mechanics work. So you can do that. Uh, it's kind of loud, <laughs> I'll say that. Tires get loud, uh, especially if you guys have cradles. Those are super loud. Um, the braking device applies load to simulate real world conditions. It's just saying you're loading the vehicle just like you would be going down the road uh, with a lot of the using the base load or using the poly interpolate function. It does take some playing with. Um, typically, the vehicles I test, pulling in fourth or fifth gear, I try to get under boost a seven second pull. So. I don't even count until I'm under boost and then I try to get a nice seven to nine second pull, plenty of data points when you're data logging so you can see what's actually happening to the vehicle. Steady state operation for fine tuning the EFI calibration. Diesel guys, do you guys do a lot of steady state? Or you just watt pulls, just, just let them rip? What's that? I try. You gonna try? Okay. Just for uh, MPG and stuff like that or try to deliver uh, like a total package? No, uh, the simulate yeah, okay. Let's see. If your EFI calibration, so the things you can measure, AFR, lambda, stoichiometry, all the same thing. Math transfer function, VE tables, all the stuff that you tune on. You do HP tuners mostly? I do both, EFI and HP. Okay. I use it for, uh, for VE tuning. Okay, cool. So that'll help with all Yeah, so you just, just fail the math and do VE tunes most <coughs> of the time? Well, we usually dial in the VE first. And okay. Then Use the math so, at the tight horsepower thing, you usually do a speed density too. Okay, cool. All right. End of the day, the dyno is just a tool. Uh, every dyno works. I have yet to encounter one that doesn't work. They all do pretty much the same thing. They might go about it in different ways. Uh, it is just a tool. You're just measuring a difference. Uh, I mean, if a dyno actually delivered you, what, what do we call them on the forums recently? Called it llama thrust. You know, instead of horsepower, you could still tune a car, right? It doesn't matter what the number is, as long as you can measure a gain. Uh, <coughs> these are just descriptions of the, the basic dynos that the Dynocom offers. And it's just showing price versus repeatability and accuracy. I'm guessing this is everybody here, right? Not you, what do you got? 75. 75, close enough. They're both rated at nine. I would call the 75 a nine and nine. I wouldn't call it a nine and eight. Uh, I, I have yet to notice a difference between the 15,000 and the 7,500 so far is just like repeatability goes when you're doing watt pulls. Why a Dynocom? Uh, Dynocom uses an interrupt based digital sample which has very high repeatability. They have precision AD converter. I am not even entirely positive what that means. I didn't design the dyno. Um, 24 bit over 8. Uh, do you know what that means better than I do, Chris? I mean, it's the number of digits you have in the data coming. From okay, awesome. More bits. So Chris should be teaching this class. Uh, high encoder speeds um, for high repeatability. Standalone operation with vehicle embedded in the system. That means 
you can stand there with your handheld. You don't need the laptop. You can sit inside the vehicle and repeat pulls over and over again. It w events Windows-based GUI, high-quality CAD and CNC design construction, structural MIG welded, rib steel frames with stainless steel. If you look at the dynos that these guys sell, they're super heavy duty. Mechanically, everything about them is, in my opinion, exponentially better than the other stuff on the market. It's very heavy duty, everything. You could just even go down to just the belts that the dynos use. The belts, when you have a belt link dyno, is a Gates belt that's this thick. It's not a rubber belt that's this thin, you know. Integrated LED lighting, safety stabilizers, PAU cooling fans. Pretty sure all of those are options. I think they probably all deliver with the safety stabilizers. All you, have, all you guys have the stabilizers on the side. My, my trailer didn't. I do now. Uh, and I've actually hit them pretty hard. They work, they work pretty good. So Integrated PAU controller for plug and play wiring. Uh, yeah, everything just plugs right up. The guys with trailers. I use my trailer all the time. Uh, did TX2K this past year. Uh, just did streetcar takeover for Dallas. I do a bunch of events at the Dragon, North Carolina, all around Atlanta. So it's really convenient just to be able to pop everything in and out and just go. I mean, it's literally just these two boxes and you're done. You know, there's nothing real complicated about setting these dynos up. High quality components, SMC, Fresnesla power absorption units, Dodge industrial bearings, the Gates HD poly chain belts, which are awesome, CNC and billet couplers, uh, multiple configurations, multiple systems available. That was the last slide we just looked at. Everything made in the USA, and they really pushed that at Dynocom being like the be made in the USA dyno. Um, the best value and return at any price and free training for life for the original owner of the dyno. All right, a complete dynamometer system is a chassis dynamometer, everything mechanical, the frame, the rolls, the bearings, power absorption unit, everything we just talked about that makes the Dynocom so great and heavy duty. Uh, the advanced embedded electronics, you guys, are you guys all familiar? You guys just took delivery. You're familiar with all the individual electronic components? I haven't even picked it up yet. You're I'm picking it up, trailer, picking it up today. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so you have the DC controller. That's the box that everything plugs into. The interfaces to your PC. You have DC handheld. This is what comes in the car with you. Starts and stops your runs. You can configure a lot of stuff from this itself. 99% uh, of the time when I tune a car, I don't even pull a number for half the first half of the tune. I just jump in with my handheld and get to play in. Um, humidity, pressure, and temperature sensor. It's just a small box plugs into the back of the DC controller and it's essentially your weather station. Um, and those are actually pretty easy to adjust if you pull it up on the handheld. You'll, you can open up the little box and there's just a potentiometer inside, put a screwdriver in it. So you can adjust it for your, your local airport or whatever you, whatever you pull your weather information from. The J box is mounted on the dyno. If you have a trailer, you can remove it. It's behind a door on the side of the trailer. Typically, is yours exposed or is it behind the door? Behind the door, behind the door yeah. That's removable and I'd take it off. Whenever you travel anywhere, you take it off. Good. If you get them wet. I've got them wet before. Yeah, I um, too. Yeah. You go through about six trucks before you get it dry. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, well, we blew ours out with air, pulled it apart and blew it, blew it out. Still took forever to dry it. Uh, junction box is just runs all the sensors into the DC controller, runs the handheld, uh, which supplies information to the handheld into the PC. Uh, the sensors and cables, the DC RPM interface box, the AFR, what do they call theirs, the AFM2? Is that Dynocom's new version of the, the AFX? They used to ship with an, a, uh, with an NTK AFX and now they call it the AFM2. Dynocom just re-released uh, because they quit making the AFX. The Dyno Compute software does graphing, reporting, data logging, archiving, and does gauges and live data. Uh, anybody that's on a really old version of the software, sometimes when you're fixing to do a run, you might lock up on that gauge screen. Mm -hmm. The new software fixes that. Uh, and if you do a firmware update, it helps exponentially. I'm still on the old software version, so I like the old software. So. What we're trying to measure when we're measuring, when we're putting a car on the chassis dyno, we want to know what the horsepower and torque of the engine are, but the dyno can only measure the torque at the roll, correct? It doesn't actually measure torque at the wheel, it measures the torque at the roll. The torque at the wheel is a ratio. So the thing to consider, an engine that produces 500 horsepower, 400 foot-pounds of torque, we can make up more math problems, but I don't think we need to. Um, and it's, okay, so we've got a car, it produces 500 horsepower, it produces 400 foot-pounds of torque. The gear ratio in first is a three to one, second is a two and a quarter to one, 
third is one and a half to one, fourth is your one to one, your final drive is a four to one. So peak torque in each gear, because each gear is gonna be a torque multiplier. So if you're in first gear and you just rip on the rolls, you're actually putting down 4,800 foot-pounds of torque to the roll. Because it's 400 times three times four. When you're, at, when you're in your one-to-one, -one, 400 times one times four is 1,600 foot-pounds. And that's actually what the dyno measures, and it's gonna work backwards from that to give you engine horsepower and engine torque. And this is the best description of when you guys use snapshot on your dyno, why you need to be in a one-to-one -one ratio. It's exactly that, because each other gear is going to multiply the torque and skew your numbers and it's also gonna get the RPM wrong. Uh, we calculate horsepower and torque. We first must calculate torque at the roll. To calculate torque at the roll due to acceleration, it's torque is equal to inertia plus the angular acceleration. The measured torque absorbed by the eddy brake uh, is the force plus, uh, force plus distance. So you add the torque roll components together, you get torque at the rolls is equal to the torque from acceleration plus the torque at the PAU, the absorbed force. Uh, the, to calculate horsepower, you use this, this formula right here. It's torque times RPM divided by 5252. <coughs> the little note at the bottom, horsepower and torque capabilities are limited by the final gear ratio at the wheels and friction between the rollers and tires. So thus we know the speed of the roll in RPMs, miles per hour, kilometers per hour, however you want to measure it, and the torque at the roll in foot-pounds, newton meters, whatever, the next step is calculate torque at the engine. So torque at the engine divided by torque at the roll is going to be equal to the RPM of the roll divided by the RPM of the engine. So if you guys, when you use your snapshot, wants to know what RPM are you starting at, that's that ratio right there. So it knows if a, the roll is spinning this fast and you say you're at this RPM on the motor, you've automatically got your ratio and that's how it solves for torque at the engine. So you see, rearranging a little algebra, torque of the engine is equal to torque of the roll times the RPM of the roll divided by the RPM of the engine. And something's missing. In order to calculate this, we need to know the engine RPM. That's where you input that in the software when you do a snapshot. That's, that's all that is. It's very simple. It's just a ratio. So here are the different kinds of RPM pickups since that's the RPM is the, the great equalizer. So no RPM pickup. The, the pros to that is easy and it's fast. There's no chance for an unclean signal, or signal dropout or spikes. But it will only calculate the roll horsepower and the roll torque. The roll horsepower is going to look just like the, the, the horsepower of the motor. It's not going to look any different. The roll torque is going to be huge. That's going to be a big number because it's going to be multiplied by the final drive. Using the snapshot, it's fast and it's easy. No chance for an unclean signal. You're not going to drop out your RPM like you would on an, an inductive pickup. Sometimes they get kind of wonky. It's only as accurate as the user operating the unit. As to say, when you hit that go button, when you're starting your run, if you're not right on the RPM you say you're on, the whole rest of the chart skewed. The ratio is wrong. Um, sometimes it doesn't make a huge difference. Most of the time it makes, it makes enough of a difference that you say, ah, I don't know about that. And then you call Dynocom and you yell at them. And <laughs> so it does skew. Uh, me personally, I always use an optical pickup. It just makes things 10 times easier, especially you guys do automatic trucks, it makes it 10 times easier when you have an optical on there. Even if you get like a flare or something or converter flash, you can see it on the chart and it makes sense. You go, I know what that is. Uh, inductive pickups, they're easy and fast and they're on every dyno jet. <laughs> uh, little no chance for user error. The hardest, the hardest thing about using those is they can be noisy. So you can get halfway through a run and then the graph will start to do this because it doesn't know what RPM it's at because it freaks out. Um, <coughs> if you have coil on plug, good luck, unless you wanna <laughs> pull it out, run a spark plug wire on number one and then clamp onto it. You can do that. Um, I like how it says moderately easy for optical. Anybody that's tried to put an optical on an import knows it's a little bit less than moderately easy. I have made so many different I just use vice grips and I have so many different vice grip clamp on little things to snake down in front of Subarus or get around the side of a Honda or whatever so I can get a good RPM pickup. Uh, engine vibration and movement, that, that can be an issue. Uh, most of the time if you can find a place to clamp onto the motor, that takes care of that issue nine times out of ten because when the motor torques and it actually tries to kick, you'll stay on point because everything moves together as a unit. Um, Optical is by far my favorite, my favorite method to use, uh, and obviously Dynocom since it says preferred. Uh, using an OBD2, 
you just plug in under the hood and get your RPM that way. Uh, it, it's an option. It's something you would, you would purchase from Dynocom. Biggest caveat to that, how many of you guys need that OBD2 port when you're tuning? All of you, right? So it's not really an option for a lot of people unless you're just doing a dyno day and you want to plug into the vehicles. So optical, optical is the preferred method. Uh, and they also have a new optical sensor now that has optical and a map embedded. So you can, if you're doing boosted cars, you can run the map through the same. Okay, I just went backwards, did I? No, I didn't. Good. Okay, so now we have torque of the engine equals torque of the roll times the RPM of the roll divided by the RPM of the engine. Next is use the engine torque and engine RPM to calculate horsepower. So horsepower of the engine is going to equal torque of the engine times the RPM of the engine divided by 5252. So that's just the basic, the basic horsepower calculation. What if we substituted the engine torque? So horsepower of the engine equals the torque of the roll times the RPM of the roll. And you see where they cancel out the RPM of the engine divided by 5252. So torque of the roll times RPM of the roll divided by 5252. So the horsepower at any of, of any shaft is going to be the same. That's what we were saying. You get the same horsepower no matter what. So you can kind of skip a step there. Uh, horsepower is equal to torque times RPM divided by 5252. So you're going to get the same horsepower no matter what. The horsepower, and in, when you run them in any gear, let's say the horsepower will be the same for any gear, you do that, you can go home and test that with an NA car. You're probably going to get pretty good results. You test it with a boosted car if you're not hitting full boost, stuff like that. You're going to be like, well, it's like 10 horsepower off, and he was wrong. Uh, you can test that theory with an NA car. Everybody go get a Coyote and test it. Those are pretty, pretty consistent cars. So gearing. Uh, mathematically, horsepower is the same for all gears and shafts, but the power delivered is not. This is due to the engine accelerating at a faster or slower rate and by the amount of load placed on the engine. So when you guys select the highest gear possible without exceeding the speed limit of the dyno for sweep test, it'll give you the best and most repeatable results. Do you guys ever have to get in final drive to load a big turbo on the diesels? You just usually go to, they'll go to the one-to-one -one and that's fine. Okay. Uh, I recommend a one-to-one -one ratio, but if you are using an RPM pickup and you're using a huge turbo, if you want to run it in fifth and you got a 200 mile an hour capable dyno, be my guest. <laughs> In order for torque calculation to be correct, the following must be true. The engine RPM pickup properly set up and maintain a clean signal. Uh, you guys are all going to pull your hair out the first time you try to use the optical until you actually figure it out. Like I said, for the cars that I test the most, I have brackets that I've made that work really well. And even sometimes you're still bending them and stuff and getting it to work. Uh, they supply it with, with a magnetic stand. If you have like a trailer, you can throw the magnetic stand on the bottom of the trailer or you guys can put a piece of plate still on the floor in the shop. And so if you've got a muscle car, something where you've got some room where you can shoot at the crank, by all means do it that way. Uh, no slippage between the engine and transmission. Everybody here has slipped the clutch on the dyno, I'm sure. It's fun. No slippage within automatic transmission as far as internal failures are concerned. I'm sure everybody here has done that too. I've destroyed my fair share of automatics. Uh, no slippage of the tire and rim or the roller. Um, everybody here has a 24. So it's not really a problem for you guys. Sometimes with, with, the, with the cradles, they'll ride up on one side under a high horsepower application, and then you can get a little bit of slip because the tire actually changes shapes and builds heat and does all kinds of funky stuff. This is the biggest rule when you guys are testing, and this is the biggest rule when you guys are tuning a car whenever you're doing anything. It's garbage in, garbage out. If you don't model things correctly when you're tuning the car, you're not going to get the desired result in the end. Um, same thing for the dyno. Set the run up wrong and you're not going to get the desired. And I'll say that's the second biggest rule to me. The first biggest rule is apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Don't go comparing a poly interpolate loaded run to a base load run to a non-loaded inertial run only. You will have slight variances if you're tuning a car. Stick with one test until you, just, you, know, until you say maybe I need to do another kind of test then just start a whole new file and start over again just to make sure everything's repeatable. Which is repeatability and accuracy. Awesome, that's the next slide. So the engine dyno is known to be repeatable due to a lack of 99% of the variables presented in the previous section. They're directly driven by the engine and need no RPM pickup, have no torque multiplication, and are operated in a climate controlled environment to maintain consistency. So that's just when you guys see engine dynos and they got the cooling tower going out of the ceiling of the shop and exhaust extraction and really nice little dyno cells. Yeah, those things are super, super repeatable. On a chassis dyno, 
you try to be con as consistent as you can. All parameters must remain consi uh, consistent within the sweep test in order to allow comparisons. So be aware of the kind of airflow you're supplying to the dyno, uh, the kind of exhaust extraction you're doing. I actually have my dyno outside of a loading dock under a big awning because it's a trailer. So I'm outside, so I, like my exhaust extraction is not a huge concern for me. We just close the garage door so I don't choke all those guys out when I, when I pull out the loading dock and onto the dyno. Lost my place. Says, if parameters are not carefully monitored and maintained, gains and losses may be masked, skewed, exaggerated, as well uh, <coughs> as other results being unrealistic. In the beginning, when I was first learning to tune, I was at a place called the Boost Creep in Colorado. Uh, Harvey Epstein, he's a Subaru tuner, really smart guy, but the first time he left me by myself to the dyno, I'm doing my pulls too close together, the car's getting too hot, not enough fan on the car forget to turn on the hoods, stuff like that, and really chase my tail on my first car. So <clears throat> it does happen. Uh, just be aware you're trying to maintain a consistent testing method, not just run the same test over and over again. Uh, and you'll get into a habit. If, if you do it right, you form a good habit. And just So every single run looks exactly the same. Unless you've got your trailer out in the field doing a dyno day, then just rip the three, make your 100 bucks, and get them out of there. You know, Here's your number, bye. <coughs> Parameters which affect power between dyno test runs, the operating temperature, the intake air temperature, the coolant temperature, exhaust gas temperature, temperature of the oil, and the temperature of the tires. Um, all those things change dynamically during the course of a run. That's why it's a good idea just to give yourself a set amount of cool down time between each run. You don't want to hurt the car either. Heat soak conditions, uh, forced induction guys. There's a lot of, lot of things to consider, especially on a gas motor forced induction. Uh, so far as being consistent, one of the biggest things, uh, most of you guys, if you just watch your IATs, you can tell if you're heat soaking, if you're sitting still and your IATs are skyjacking, you know, you're going to want to move some fans around, get something cool off, uh, and don't, don't necessarily blow a fan directly at the IAT sensor because that could just be a little, <laughs> little false cooling right there. You're not really getting the, getting the ventilation you need. Also, forced induction, guys, is a good idea. Have a fan directly on your intercooler, a fan directly on, on your radiator. But it's a good idea to have a big fan to blow across the entire car because the whole exhaust system is what's causing you to heat soak. So you want to be able to blow across the headers or across the exhaust manifold and pull all that heat out of the back of the car too. It helps a ton. Um, inadequate exhaust ventilation to prevent external exhaust gas recirculation. So <coughs> if you're sitting in the shop and you're doing a bunch of runs and you got the garage door cracked and you got a little box fan from Walmart sitting over there against the garage door. You're not getting everything out of the shop. You, you know, open the door all the way up. Worst case scenario, if you just have the door open all the way up, you're doing 10 times more than putting a little fan at a cracked door nine times out of 10. Because uh, you're essentially creating EGR, you know, the emissions. All new cars have, a lot, of, a lot of new cars have air pumps. A lot of them use the variable cam system to create an EGR effect to get better gas mileage. You're not going for gas mileage when you're doing watt pools, so you don't need to fill your your shop up full of gas and suck it back into the intake and you don't need to be breathing it either. Inadequate airflow over the heat exchangers and fresh air for, for induction systems. I think I've already basically said all that. Uh, the dyno power absorption unit temperature and bearing temperature, tire pressure, strapping force, all these things can affect the way the dyno reads. When you, get on, when you first get on the dyno and the bearings are cold, if you just run and do a rip and you do another one right after it, it's going to be different. It's a good idea to get on the dyno and roll it for a minute, let the bearings warm up, just let everything get up to temp, and just like a car, let everything get up to temp so, so everything will be consistent. Uh, the run start stop consistency, full RPM range. So like we said earlier, if you're using a snapshot and you do it wrong, it's gonna skew everything from there on. But oh, it's a good idea in the software, and I'll show you later, and I'll show you when we go downstairs, even if your first sample is bad, if you're just tuning the car and you, you, you can always pull a number later for the customer, right? But if you have three tunes you have to do that day, your first sample is bad, it's still a baseline. So you lock the snapshot ratio in the software, then you have a bad baseline, but you can have gains on top of that. You can still tune the car and still find your gains throughout the curve. The, curve, the shape of the curve is going to be the same. It's just pushed this way a little bit, you know? and maybe torques up here and horsepower falls off a little bit in the end because it's all moved down in RPMs, but you can still tune the car and you can always go back and do another snapshot and get them their graph. Uh, wall film conditions, fuel, pre-ignition. 
why did they even I'm not doing a tuning class they included wall film conditions <laughs> um just considerations as far as like transients can you know something to consider when you're tuning also I'm, now i'm starting to t i'm teaching a tuning class now all of a sudden engine load versus dyno load uh gear changes the number one job of the ecu is to determine how much stuff to add to the cylinder so engine load equals cylinder pressure which equals torque and all this is going to affect your your power run to run repeatability and accuracy we're still environment uh your air quality your temperature your humidity and your pressure um if you guys don't have one of the small weather stations you can manually enter your temperature humidity and pressure into the software uh air quality like i said don't just run the dyno in a, in a shop with a closed door Yes. And that can be a very different temperature. Exactly. The yeah. So be aware. You got to keep the air moving. Mm -hmm. And also, don't don't set don't set your computer up behind the car and have your weather station dangling in the exhaust stream, getting warm, giving you really, really, really awesome numbers because it's 32 degrees outside and it's sitting in the exhaust stream. Um, Actually, it's a terrible idea to have the, dyno, the, the computer for the dyno behind the car anyway because exhausts basically spit out negative ions all the time. So you want to move the, the computer a little ways away from the car. Um, the vehicle considerations, tire temperature and pressure. We just went over all of this, didn't we? <laughs> Fuel timing, engine load, gearing speed. Um, the operator, this has everything to do with you. The run, start, and stop timing, we just talked about that, how you can screw, uh, skew your graph down the line. Your tie-down force, the way you strap the car down, um, are you pulling it, especially if you have a cradle, are you pulling it down in between the cradles where it's actually making contact with the, cradle, with the side of the cradle that's on the load sensor, not just the side that's strapped to the eddy brake. Um, general operation, just being consistent, paying attention to what you're doing maintaining the same kind of test uh, gearing and shifting manual transmission that's pretty easy you pop it in a gear you know what gear you're in and you just repeat the test in that gear automatic transmissions with torque converters good luck you will figure it out uh, especially if you have software where you can lock it in a gear by all means that's the best that's the best way to do it uh, if you're out in the field doing a dyno day do your best uh, a lot of times it's just start at 3000 rpm and kind of roll into it if they're boosted they'll forgive you um, the sensors of the dyno, the speed sensor, and the load cell. Um, speed sensor does exactly what it sounds like. It picks up vehicle speed. The load cell actually just measures the force coming from the eddy. Um, installation and setup. The, uh, install dyno as per the instruction manual. Uh, I do a lot of these dyno installations. And I can tell you guys, the stuff that sounds silly is usually the most important part. Cutting little two by two metal plates and putting them under your leveling bolts putting those composite shims underneath the dyno, like put them everywhere. Uh, it helps absorb some of the vibrations, especially the smaller dynos. You guys all have pretty big stout dynos, not as much to worry about. Um, just pop the CD in your computer, plug in the DC controller. Okay, this is talking about the software installation now. So you put your CD in, run it, plug in your DC controller and install the drivers for it. Um, this is electromagnetic interference and radio frequency and power issues. Highly recommend a power conditioner. So if you guys have, when you're operating your dyno and you go to the manual power absorption unit screen, which you're on the old software, one, two, three, the one with the percentage, the pounds. If the pounds are dancing after, at the end of a run, you're having some sort of electromagnetic interference. And it could be something as simple as you're in an aluminum building and when you end the run and that electromagnetic field collapses, it has nowhere to go. It all goes into the digital. Um, get a power bar, uh, some sort of a line conditioner, it helps tremendously. Uh, also grounding the vehicle helps a lot. Uh, of course, you're also a diesel, so you have a lot less to worry about as far as grounding the vehicle. Ground them anyway. That's good, awesome. <laughs> uh, grounding the vehicle helps tremendously, uh, especially if you drive the ground six feet into the ground and then you just, you know, you gotta do is use a uh, power uh, battery cable and just grab a piece of every vehicle that goes on the dyno. Um, so far as your wiring, uh, uh, 200 240 VAC I think most of the 24s they recommend 30 40 amps uh, the higher the power coming in means the higher output of the eddy uh, some people see that as a good thing because they're like great that means I can apply more force to my dyno well that also means as you get to play with the uh, PAU correction factor you know about this right you played with yours 
So you got more force coming in, you need to let the dyno know, or the software know, that there is more force coming in. So it's a good idea to get an NA vehicle, run the NA vehicle inertially, and then run it under a set, set, couple of different settings of load and try to get everything to line up as best you can with the, using the uh, power absorption unit correction factor. So when we go through the software, I'll show you guys where that stuff is, because not enough people know where that stuff is. Um, the software setup, dyno parameters, put in your serial tag info that's on the side of the dyno, uh, Nine times out of ten, it'll actually ship with that stuff already in. That's a good idea to check it, just make sure it's right. Uh, graph format, make sure you lock the axis for horsepower and torque. Otherwise, you guys will call me and say it's not crossing at 52.52. <laughs> and I get to say, oh, go lock the axis. Um, view, the gauges, edit, uh, properties for default layout. You just go to properties and select default layout, and it'll bring up the gauges, the basic gauge set that we ship the dinos with that you would normally see. Um, the setup analog inputs and calibrate your wideband. Did everybody get a wideband with their dyno? Your yeah, one point of locking your axis is uh, when, the, when you're left and your right uh, data element are related. Yes, exactly. But if you're plotting air fuel, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah, so if you're not related to air fuel, yeah, really then it just then it doesn't. Trace yeah, them on the same graph exactly. And leave it unlocked. So then it's going to go a scale yeah. that matches the data. Exactly. That's a good point. Let's see. Is the wide band just for gas, diesel? It does lambda. It does lambda. It does lambda. Um, I mean, alcohol can kill, like race gas can kill a wide band pretty quickly, too. So just, it's pretty easy to kill wide bands, in my opinion. <laughs> Most of them yeah, out there. Them the side, they're gonna go out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, have plenty, have plenty of backups. Uh, general guidelines, always check your, your tire and vehicle condition prior to a dyno session. I work uh, in a very close relationship with a shop. We have sort of a symbiotic relationship, a shared space, and they pass me cars all the time. Then I go, this guy needs to buy tires, or you guys need to put it on an alignment rack, or I'm very fickle about the cars that I run to. But it's, you know, check your tire pressure when the car's coming on, and check the vehicle condition in general. You don't want to have any leaks. You don't want to be spill, spouting oil all over the dyno, or have a fuel leak and catch it on fire, or guys running meth kits, you don't want to like go to hit boost and then it sprays meth all over the windshield and catches the windshield on fire. True story. Um, so the vehicle condition, pretty important. Uh, when you bring the vehicle up, dummy strap it, strap it kind of loose, and then just roll it real slow and the vehicle will always center up on the rolls. That way you're not sitting wonky and having a bumpy ride and when you, it, in the event that you do lose a strap, it doesn't want to swing a direction. It'll just sort of the vehicle will just sort of settle in. If you lose a strap, and you're pretty, you're pretty centered. Uh, guys with cradle dynos, they can just jump on and center them. They don't have to worry so much about dummy strapping them first. But you don't want to fall. If you guys have tried falling back and forth off the rolls the first time you ever put a vehicle in, I guess if you do a lot of automatics. It's not a consideration. But let's see. Secure the vehicle with four straps in the rear and two in the front uh, for two wheel drive. And I do four and four. On my dyno, my dyno is all-wheel drive. Uh, you always want to cross the center. You want to make an X and then have straights. Um, the X is just going to keep you centered up. The straights are, that's your go-to if you try to pull off. That's how we use the center. You center them up, just roll them? With the X. Oh, you just drag them over? So you let it roll and somebody tightens the X up? Yeah. That works too. Uh, it's pretty easy. If you just put your straights on and just roll it, it will just find its center and then you just hit the brake on the dyno. Um, always have an X though on the back of the car. Uh, if you're doing all-wheel drive, always have an X on both ends of the car. Always route the straps to protect them from heat. Uh, open wastegate beware. I love dump the atmosphere. Do not run a strap underneath it. It'll <laughs> blow through it real fast. Um, especially Subarus because they dump down not out the hood like all the Civic guys and stuff. Always route the cables away from EMI RF generating sources. This is when you're actually setting up your dyno. One thing, don't bundle all the wires up. Separate everything out. You don't want to have a bunch, like the power, the 12 volt crossing over the DB25 and vice versa. You, the USB wrapped around braid. Don't make a braid with them or anything like that. Run them all away from each other. Give them their own room to breathe. Uh, if you have something in your shop that's kind of noisy, we have an alignment rack in the 70s, and every time it's on, my dyno freaks out. So, you know, there are things to consider, and it's got it's full of tubes and stuff. It looks like an old guitar amp. Uh, never turn the steering wheel during dyno operation. Hold it straight. Everybody here is rear wheel drive, right? 
or two wheel drive. You never touch it. When you're running rear wheel drive, yeah, you just sit like this. It doesn't matter. Uh, you're running a front wheel drive car, all wheel drive car, always keep your hand on the, at least one hand on the wheel. And yeah, never turn it because the car will turn. That's what they do. Um, always test run at low loads and speed and recheck the straps before proceeding. So it's a good idea to do, do a dummy run, bring it up to 55 miles an hour, bring it up to 80 miles an hour, whatever. Hit your brake and get out and check everything uh, before you do a wide open pull. After you guys get your system down and you're used to it, you know what you're doing. Uh, it's just be careful. Uh, never apply the vehicle's brakes during dyno operation. Always pay attention to onlookers around the dyno area. Uh, always ground the vehicle to prevent voltage transients. Uh, something we mentioned earlier, being able to ground the vehicle to keep everything consistent and not freaking out. Uh, diagnostic tuning and EFI calibration, no logging. So this is the mode one operation. There are two ways to operate your dyno. We'll call them mode one and mode two. Mode one is when you're only using the handheld. Uh, so you're not using your PC at this point. Uh, this is when you flip on your dyno, it'll tell you your software version and say Dynocom Industries and then it'll go to the AFR screen. So that's the first screen that you'll see. It's the default screen. Plus and minus on the plus and minus keys on the handheld are actually how you turn the AFR on and off when you have your AFR hooked up. You'll set the RPM that you, that you want to attain. When you attain the RPM, it'll lock the dyno in. It'll hold you at that RPM so you can oscillate your foot, hit your different load cells, press the plus button, and you're going to step up to the net, whatever the next defined step in RPM is, uh, and you can define that under the setup menu. Uh, the same thing for speed, the same thing for load. You just, just set, define a set of steps. Once it's attained by the dyno, you press the plus button to increase, plus minus button to decrease to back yourself back down. Uh, there is an entire write-up. There's a PDF that writes this up entirely on how to use this. The run styles you can select from the roll-on, which is the sweep test, a, neg a negative power test, race and PAU, steady state testing for power and torque. Uh, when you, when you want to start to graph, you're going to go to the top and select new session wizard. So it's just the little magic wand on the tree. You enter, the, you enter all the vehicle information. Uh, it prompts you. So everything you have to enter, you're prompted to enter. You just go through two screens of entering information about the vehicle. Then you'll select a new run. You're going to enter in what kind of RPM pickup you're using. So if you're using snapshot, this is where you're going to select that. If you're using uh, an optical, this is where you're going to select that. And then <clears throat> you let it know you're doing a roll on or a watt pull. So it's a roll-on sweep. And your load options, you can, you can either enter a base load. You can use just inertial. You just leave that stuff alone, leave it at zero. You can use base load. You can use an interpolate load, which is say, I want to start with this load and end with this amount. Or you can use a poly interpolate, which divides it into sections. So it'll step up through the different loads. Um, same thing as, as using any other, you know, same, same operation as in mode one. Use the go button to start, to start a pull. Uh, start and stop. Let's see. That's basically it. Just when you're starting your snapshot, hit go. When you're done with your run, hit that and then bring the vehicle to a stop using the brakes and safely exit the vehicle. This is a lot easier for me to show you guys than it is to talk.